Good afternoon, everybody. I am really excited that Johnny Earl, the founder of Johnny Cupcakes, is here today with us. And uh, he's going to be sharing with us his incredible story of how he um, got his really badass but sweet symbol and turned that into a multi-million dollar business. And um, you know that Johnny's been a bit, big hit because he's been featured in uh, Newsweek magazine, in Inc. magazine, Boston Globe, USA Today, Business Weeks, just to, uh, just to name a few. So obviously, he's really successful. And uh, I have to say, I was really impressed with Johnny when I saw him speak in Chicago a couple years ago. And uh, he's certainly a very multi-talented individual. And during his spare time, when he has spare time, while he's running his uh, very successful business, he likes to read. And also, he's working on writing a couple of business books. And the interesting thing about Johnny is that when he was a kid, he got a magic set uh, as a Christmas present, and he started one of his entrepreneurial um, endeavors doing magic shows at parties, and he'll tell you more about that. And so I asked him, are you still practicing magic? And he pulled a pen out of my ear. <laughs> so so he's, he's definitely still practicing magic. So I would like to bring Johnny Earl up to the stage. And Johnny, it's all yours. Do we have Johnny? There he is. Oh, check, check. Um, so my name is Johnny Cupcakes. Uh, my last name spells out cupcakes, but it's actually pronounced Kupkakis, and it's Portuguese. Uh, I'm just kidding, that's not my real last name. If, uh, if Cupcakes was my real last name, then my future daughter would be very promiscuous. So uh, I'm going to stick with my real last name, which is Earl. I like music. I like Wu-Tang Clan. I like oysters. I like Mario Kart 64. I like to floss my teeth all the time. I always keep one of these in my back pocket. I actually keep two in case I run out. Um, I like Home Alone. It's one of my favorite movies. But the people who live there now do not like me soliciting in front of their house. And I, uh, the only thing that I don't like is traffic. And growing up as a kid, I would see my parents um, really frustrated about their 9 to 5 job. But it was mostly the time that they wasted sitting in traffic every day, which was time that took away from them raising my little sister and I. So at a young age, I told myself, you know what, if I'm, someday I'm going to figure out a way to work for myself and, and uh, maybe start my own business and someday support my family. So at a young age, uh, this is me. Uh, not much has changed. I still have all those toys and I can still fit into those clothes. Uh, there's my family. There's my dad with his award-winning mustache. And that's me pretending to eat my little sister. And uh, my parents just raised me to not really care what anyone else thinks and to be myself, which you can see here. I kind of rolled out of bed and went to student photo day and there I am. And uh, lastly, there's my little sister and I. So um, at a young age and to this day, I say, you know, do more of what makes you happy. Uh, it's very important. You know, life is pretty short and it's good to be uh, independent or at least, you know, if you're not going to work for yourself, at least find a company that makes you really happy. Um, so do more of what makes you happy unless that's like drugs or prostitution or anything like that. You know what I mean? Follow your passion. Um, very, very important, and there's some people who complain so much, but it's almost like they're not happy unless they have something to complain about, and we're all guilty of having one of those friends, and if you are not guilty of having one of those friends, then you might be that friend. So, you know, try and set some goals, follow your passion, a little step by step, and that's what I did at a young age. I started out by selling lemonade. I graduated to yard sales. Uh, when my family wasn't home, I'd sell my dad's old tools and my sister's My Little Ponies. I got in trouble, so I had to stop doing that. Um, winters rolled around. I'm from Boston, Massachusetts, and the winters are pretty crazy. We get a lot of snow. And as much as I love sledding, I chose to take a break to invest in a snow shovel and start making some extra money. 
Uh, as much as I love sledding, and I guess now you can kind of equate it, you know, as much as you love partying, it might be nice to take a step back and put 110% into a mini project to help raise some funds to put into another project. And that's what I did at a young age. Um, I could barely push the snow shovel, but this actually worked out to my advantage because people felt bad for me, so they gave me extra money as a tip. Um, and I, I really wanted to make some extra money because all of my winter gloves had holes in them because I wanted to be Freddy Krueger or uh, Wolverine, so I'd take my mom's vegetable skewers and I'd poke them through all of my winter gloves. Um, so I was like, I'm gonna shovel snow, make some money. So I was getting paid $20 a driveway. If I could do five driveways in one day, that's $100 cash um, that the government doesn't even know about. So that's a lot of money, um, especially at that age. So I kept doing these little projects, um, graduated to selling drinks up and down Nantasket Beach. I had no legal permits. But even the town police were excited that this little kid was making something out of nothing. Um, somehow I got into magic tricks. I was eight years old. My parents got me a magic kit. And I started doing magic shows at birthday parties. I get paid $20 a half hour just to do something that I was passionate about. Um, and, and this is one of my favorite things because I got to uh, curate an experience for people. And I think at the end of the day, when you have a business, a passion, a hobby, Whatever it is you're doing, it's the experience that really separates you from everyone else. It's those little details and the, the non-tangible things, the things that make people have a feeling. Um, so this is an actual ad that my mom put in the newspaper for me for my birthday. Um, it's a cute advertisement when, when I'm a kid, but I'm 31 years old now, and if I put this in the newspaper now, it looks a little molesty. So my mom gave me a scrapbook for Christmas a couple years ago, and this was the actual newspaper article. Now, two things that were a little messed up is, uh, is actually one thing that's a little messed up, is my mom would straight up drop me off at strangers' houses <laughs> that would call up on the newspaper ad. And I'm like, Mom, someday I'm really going to disappear. You can't just do that. So this was going good for a little while, and uh, this is an actual photo of my very first magic show. It was at my sister's birthday party. I remember every kid in this photo. I stopped hanging out with most of them because their parents were really mean. But um, I was so infatuated with the audience and the experience that I had to take a photo. Um, so before I forget, I'm going to take a photo of you guys right now for my blog. So um, yeah, that was great. I loved it, and, and it made me realize that you can really do something that you love, and you can make money from it and, and be happy. And that was one of my, my favorite jobs that I did, and I still do it on the side sometimes. So throughout middle school, and, and uh, I, I had a, uh, a borderline learning disability. I had a really hard time focusing. I never took any drugs for it, uh, mostly because my parents couldn't afford them. And secondly, I didn't really believe in it. I believed that it wasn't really a learning disability. It was a superpower because I clearly knew what I did not want to do, which was like all of my homework. Um, <laughs> but if I did find something that I was passionate about, I would focus at 110%. I would almost obsess over things. It was like, you know, it was almost a form of OCD. And it didn't help my grades, though. So my parents were like, we got to put you in a charter school, this you know, special startup school. And I was like, oh, great. i got to take this funny little bus with all these funny little people. And then I realized that I was one of those funny little people, and everything was going to be all right. So I hopped in this bus. I went to the South Shore Charter School from 8th grade to, to 12th grade. And it was good for me personally, because I had a hard time learning. And the, the smaller classrooms really helped. And I got to learn at my own level. And it was one of the best things that happened to me. Um, but there was no entrepreneurship classes back then. Um, a lot of things have changed. Back then, most people did not even know how to spell the word entrepreneurship, never mind say it. And uh, this was before social media. Um, but I was figuring out ways to, to make money the old-fashioned way. And, uh, and I still think that's important. It's good to have a balance of both. Um, but in eighth grade, with my, uh, with my learning difficulties, I still figured out a way to make some extra money at school. Um, the school did not have a yearbook, so I took my personal scrapbook and I turned it into the school's very first yearbook. Now, since I had little to no startup money, um, something that any of you guys can do with any idea, any project, whether it be big or small, 
is, uh, I'll, I'll, oh, this is me. This is, I called myself the editor, even though this consisted of no words. It was all photos except these words right here. Um, and I used to want to be a gangster, so I wore really big clothes because I thought it would make me be really tough, but it didn't, and I never really grew, so that's me. So if you have little to no startup money, a, a great solution is taking pre-orders, um, selling a product before it exists. It's a way to take a very calculated risk, um, and there's a few things that can help foster that and make it uh, successful. Timing really helps. Um, realizing that if you're going to push a product or a promotion that uh, you probably shouldn't promote it to somebody on a Monday because most people don't even want to look at anyone else on a Monday. Uh, people get paid at the end of the week, you know, so that really helps. Or doing it around the holidays when people are more apt to, to buy more gifts. Um, offering an incentive. Why is somebody going to give you money for a product or a service that doesn't even exist yet? Um, give them an incentive, a discount, or, or say, hey, if you purchase this now, I'll throw in some free stickers, or it'll be a two-for-one. Um, really get them excited. Having a physical sample helps. It makes it less sketchy. You're not like, yo, give me money for this thing that doesn't exist yet. You could be like, this is what I'm offering. This is what I developed. It's coming out in a few months. Um, you know, do you want to support my project? Approach the right people and, uh, and approach people you know. Maybe you have a hard time soliciting your ideas to complete strangers, but you know, your friends, your family, your colleagues, your coworkers, all these people want to see you succeed. So that's a good way to test out your business and, and pitching your ideas is through, your, uh, through the people that you know. So in eighth grade, I was pre-selling these yearbooks. I made $2,000. It wasn't that bad. And, and again, it, it was a $1,500 cash profit, which was money that the government didn't even know about. So that was a lot of money back then. Um, and I, got in, I, I didn't get in trouble, but the school realized how much money I was making. So they decided to make their own yearbook. And I had to figure out something else to sell. Um, but I made a calculated risk. When I bought the yearbooks, when I ordered them, I knew exactly how many to order. And um, I knew exactly how much money I was going to be making. And if I didn't have that many pre-orders, that's fine. Or I can you know, scrap everything and work a little bit harder. But it's a great way to test things out. Now there's websites like kickstarter.com and indiegogo.com. You know, great way to test out some of your ideas. Um, so I had to figure out what else can I do. And I was always a prankster. Um, Pee Wee Herman was one of my biggest role models um, before the whole movie theater thing. And, and after too, but I, I just, um, I love playing pranks on people. And I used to buy so many pranks from this one joke shop that the owner sat down with me and he said, listen, Johnny, I appreciate your business, but how would you like it if I told you you could get 144 whoopee cushions for the price of four retail whoopee cushions? I was like, whoa, that's a lot of whoopee cushions. I don't know what I'm gonna do with them all, but that's a great deal. And that day I was introduced to the world of wholesale. I went home that day, I had two catalogs. One was Oriental Trading Company, and the other one was Rhode Island Novelty. And next week when I went to school, I had all these whoopee cushions. Now when I was playing pranks on people, now I can say, that can be yours for a small price of $4.99. And most people would give me the middle finger or not support me because I embarrassed them in front of the whole classroom. But some people did buy my whoopee cushions. And I made enough money to pay for them all so now I have over 100 whoopee cushions left. Anything I sell is a profit. And uh, you know, not too many people were buying them, so I would trade them. Um, I would trade them at lunch for other people's snacks. And then I'd take those snacks and I'd resell them to other people. So I had this cool little process going on. Um, and I still had a lot of whoopee cushions, so for the next couple years, um, all of my friends and family got a whoopee cushion for their birthday, for Christmas, for Easter, for, uh, for Valentine's Day. And, uh, you know, they, I think they still have them, too. I would reinvest that money. And now, when you start a business, it's, a, it's attractive to, to be like, cool, I made a bunch of money. Now I can get my car fixed. Um, but you know what? Sometimes you've got to drive with a loud muffler to, to, so you can keep reinvesting that money back into your ideas until you have a good cushion to spend some of that money on the things that you want or need. Um, so I was reinvesting my money back into my little business and I started purchasing itching powder, fart spray, stink bombs, switchblade combs. And I would resell all this stuff in school. I'd go up and down the hallway with my oversized Orlando Magic starter jacket with the pouch in the front. Um, I didn't even like sports back then, but I wanted to be a magician. And there was a jacket that said magic on it, so I got it. Um, so itching powder was great. This was one of my biggest sellers. 
Now, one day I got in trouble because someone had an allergic reaction and had to get rushed to the emergency room because they were allergic to the itching powder and they had a rash all over their back. They were, it was covered with hives. Um, so they had to get rushed to the emergency room. This isn't really their back. I actually got this off a of Google image search. At first I typed in rash and then I was like, oh no. So then I typed in back rash. But then I went back and I was like, wait a minute, can that really happen? So make sure you wear protection. So I got in trouble, I got suspended, um, and I was like, sweet, school vacation. I went home, and then I realized all my friends were at school. There was no good things on TV. I had to watch, you know, MASH and Golden Girls and Cash for Gold commercials. And I was like, I really want to just go back to school and, and, and figure out something else to sell. Now, since all of my friends were selling drugs at the time, I had to figure out something else to sell, so I decided to sell candy. I'm introduced to the world of wholesale, and I know that I can get anything in the world at inexpensive prices as long as I buy a lot of them. So I started buying M&Ms, Sour Patch Kids, Sour Patch Watermelons, the best things in the world, um, Swedish Fish. And I started selling candy in school, even though there was a school store, um, I had all the good stuff. I'd come home every day with a backpack full of cash, and this was, this was great. You know, some weeks were amazing. Some other weeks were bad because I didn't have my license yet. I was 15 years old. So I had to get a ride to, you know, to BJ's or Costco to, to re-up on my candy. So this was going great. Um, there were some weeks where I could make $1,000 uh, cash a week. If I could just sell two pa uh, one pack of candy two times a day, um, you know, Five days a week, that's $1,000 cash while I'm 15 years old. This didn't, again, this didn't happen every week, but there were weeks where this happened, and it was amazing. Even my drug dealer friends were like, wait a minute, how much money did you make? And I was like, guys, you bought most of the snacks for me because you had the munchies. You're like my number one customer. And they were like, oh, yeah. I was like, all right, well... So I got in trouble. I was selling more candy than the school store did, so I had to figure out something else to sell. The school store donates money to school functions, and I was donating money to my whoopee cushions and not having to get a real job. So one of the requirements to graduate um, my, my, the, the high school I went to, the charter school, was to get an internship. And this is a very valuable thing because you learn hands-on what you want to do for the rest of your life or what you do not want to do for the rest of your life. And um, I was very thankful that I got this internship. Um, you're never too old to intern, to volunteer, to job shadow. Um, and events like, the, like this is so important because you get to network and learn from other people's mistakes. And it's, um, it's very valuable. So give yourself a round of applause just for being here today. A lot of people have brilliant, brilliant ideas, but some people have billion dollar ideas, but they're afraid of failing and they're afraid of taking that first step. And some of them won't even like buy a ticket to go attend a really cool conference. Um, knowledge is very powerful. Uh, so try to network as much as you can while you're at this event. But anyways, I was doing the internship. I was flipping through the telephone book trying to figure out what I was passionate about. There was a construction company. You know, I'm not really built for that. Um, there was some escort service. I didn't know what that was, but I called the number and then I hung up really quick. Uh, there was a plumbing company. I love to make a lot of poo-poo jokes, but I don't want to be a part of the poo-poo police. Um, but I'll tell you a poo-poo joke real quick. What's brown and rhymes with Snoop? Dr. Dre. All right. So then I found it. There was a company that prints t-shirts, and I can't really afford many t-shirts. But I was like, you know what? Why don't I figure out how to make these things? And there's a really great quote from, um, from the singer of the band Rage Against the Machine. Uh, and I didn't understand it when I was younger, but now I understand it. And I'm like, that's a pretty great quote. He said, um, forget about the G-Rides. I want the machines that are making them. So he didn't even want to buy a Mercedes G-Wagon. He wanted to get the machines that are making them. And I was like, that's pretty cool. He cut out the middleman figured out how to get this stuff made. So I was learning how to get these shirts made, although I could not afford to get cool graphic t-shirts. Um, and this was great. I didn't think of my brand just yet, my t-shirt brand. But I was getting shirts made for all of my friends' bands. And any time a t-shirt would come out of that, that uh, dryer, it was like an idea machine. And it was, it was wonderful. Um, so again, volunteer, um, get an internship, job shadow, ask questions, go to conferences, take notes, learn from other people's mistakes. 
Um, so learning hands-on is key. Um, I think it's very important for entrepreneurs, and I think it's important for everybody. It, it, it sticks. I mean, you can read about things in books all day and all night, which is, which is great, but when you go out and you actually do it, it, it it's something that you don't forget. Um, and if you fail, that's okay too, because you will never forget that, and it'll help you be a stronger person. Um, so you have to put 110% into your ideas. You cannot half-step them. I mean, you can, but then someone else might come along and do it better and quicker. So I was uh, cutting back on things that I was spending an excessive amount of time on. Um, I was cutting back on video games, social media, television. Oh, social media wasn't out yet. Uh, television. Um, I had a girlfriend at the time who wasn't super supportive. And, you know, uh, I, I figured I should build a strong foundation for my life before I take on the responsibilities of another human's emotions. And um, so that was a big thing. At first, I was really bummed out, but after a week went by, I was like, whoa, look at all this money I'm saving. This is awesome. <laughs> and, uh, and then partying. Although I grew up with drug dealers, um, I've never really partied. Um, I've never, I, I love the smell of marijuana. I've almost purchased it to burn as incense, but instead I bought sage, which wards off evil spirits and smells like pot. So um, I've never tried alcohol before, but I've purchased beer because I like the cool packaging. I've never had a sip of beer in my life. And the amount of money and time, the most valuable thing that you have, um, I was saving this on Thursdays, Fridays, Saturdays, while people were recouping on Sundays and half of Mondays. Those were five days a week that I was operating at 110% with all of my little weird business ideas. And that time and money really helped build a foundation to, to launch these ideas. It's, it, the, your time is the most valuable thing that you have. Um, so you don't have to cut out any of this stuff, but if you can just recognize what you spend a lot of time on and, and try to reinvest that time and money into your ideas, the, the more you put in, the more you get back. It's as simple as that. So although I don't party, when I go to parties, I'll just brown bag a Capri Sun juice drink so nobody bothers me, and I'll bring Aurigel with me, which is like a gel format of Novocaine. It makes your mouth numb when you have a cavity. So the jokester inside of me will put this on the rims of my friends' drinks when they're, when they're not looking. And by the time they go hit on some cute girls, they start drooling down their face. <laughs> so I, you know, I have a great time at parties and I save a lot of money and I like don't get in car accidents and I don't get random people pregnant and I don't get puked on and I don't get in fights and I remember what happened. But there are some people who drink responsibly and that's cool too, but uh, you know, and you could go party and, you know, blank out if you'd like, just when you are ready to start your business, realize that if you don't put 110% into it, someone else will, and they'll do it quicker and better, and, and that's what it comes down to. So um, I tried out college for a little bit. My parents were very supportive. Um, I didn't know what I was passionate about just yet. I went to school to learn how to record music. Um, but I, you know, I was so distracted by all of these ideas to start a business. And I figured, you know, since the school that I'm at is not fostering entrepreneurship, um, maybe I should take a small break to find out what I'm passionate about before, before I go back, just to make some more clear decisions. And, uh, and that was a good personal decision for me. And I, and I wish I was at a school that had more classes and that offered different programs, but, but I didn't. I was at, like, a music school. So I took a break. I invested my money into a pin making machine off of eBay. It makes these little pins, buttons, badges. And, uh, and this was great. I would watch Cartoon Network. I'd pump out all these different designs. I'd resell them at concerts. Uh, my, friend would, my friend's little brother would resell them for me at his school. I'd give him a certain percentage of the profits. And we had this little arts and crafts mafia thing going on. It was awesome. And um, everything was going great. Um, and I decided to team up with a friend of mine because I thought it would be cool. Like, if you start a business with your friends, you get to hang out every day and put your ideas together and things could be awesome. But it was the worst decision I made um, because you can jeopardize a friendship when you start a business with a friend. There's always going to be one person that works harder than the other person and it's going to build up some animosity and angst and, and you know, if that's your friend, you don't want to screw up a friendship. Um, but everything was going great. Our profits doubled, tripled. We got our pins sold in all these retail stores around Massachusetts. And once my friend got a girlfriend, he had a newfound passion, and he was not putting 110% into our business. Um, our pin business ended up failing, but I kept positive, and I was like, you know what, if I start a business again, 
Although it might be a little more difficult, I'm going to do it independently and see what happens. So I went to Joanne Fabrics. I would buy fleece fabric. I'd buy a yard of it um, on sale for $3. $3, I'd go home with a yard of fabric. I'd get a pizza cutter, and I would make my own scarves. Now, when you cut fleece fabric, it does not fray. So you do not need to know how to sew to make some comfy scarves. Um, so when I would spend $3, I would get three scarfs from one yard of fabric that I would sell for $30 each. So I was making an $87 profit any time I spent $3. I would flip these scarfs for $30 each. Um, this was one of my, my, my great businesses. Um, but once summertime rolled around, uh, I had to figure out you know, something else to sell. I was working at Newberry Comics, which is a record shop in Massachusetts, similar to Amoeba Records. and. I received a bunch of random nicknames. Uh, this is the car I used to drive to work. There's nothing wrong with it. It got me from point A to point B. And, um, and I loved it. I might even get it again. Um, but while I was working at Newberry Comics, I received all these really strange nicknames. For no reason at all, I worked with a lot of goofballs. And they'd call me Johnny Appleseed. Or when I was late for work, they'd call me Johnny Come Lately. And uh, Johnny Cupcakes came out of nowhere. I put it on a shirt as a joke while I was getting t-shirts made for the hardcore metal band that I used to be in. And uh, I went to work and I wore this Johnny Cupcake shirt and all these slightly miserable people that would never make eye contact with me, they started laughing and looking up and asking questions. And what is that? What's Johnny Cupcakes? Is that a bakery? Is that an adult movie store? Like, what is that? I don't understand it. And I was like, no, 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 no. It's just this, it's just a nickname. It's just a t-shirt that I made. And it delighted so many complete strangers and, and it made them smile that I was like, you know, I'm, maybe I should make more of these t-shirts. So I began putting my time and money into these t-shirts and, and, and I found my newfound passion and it was great. And I began poking fun at pop culture, replacing popular icons with cupcakes. This was in 2001 when I was uh, 18, 19 years old. Uh, and it was before the whole cupcake boom, so it was still very weird. Someone was putting cupcakes on t-shirts. Um, it didn't make sense at all. Um, so here's a few of them just to give you an idea. And just in case you're lost, I do not sell real food. I own t-shirt bakeries that sell t-shirts that are displayed in refrigerators. The stores smell like frosting. It's an experience-based t-shirt brand. Um, I'll get into that in just a sec. I thought I was clever with this photo shoot. I had this model eat leaves because he was wearing a panda shirt. I found out like seven years later that pandas don't even eat leaves, they eat bamboo. It's my poo-poo jokes. On the back of the shirt, there's Alka-Seltzer tablets with little cupcakes on them to go along with the front of the design. Uh, do you remember those Got Milk advertisements? I wanted to do some that say Got Cupcakes, and I would have my t-shirt models have like frosting smeared on their face, and I got like, I got like 10,000 flyers made and I was really promoting this and, and I thought it was clever. And then I realized it looked like something else so I stopped doing it. It looked like mashed potatoes. Some other shirts. Make cupcakes not war. There's a chubby chef slam dunking a cupcake. We package these in little teeny sneaker boxes that were collectible. Plain dropping cupcakes instead of bombs. Uh, he's holding a bag of sprinkles that says legalized cupcakes.